The China I knew ached, and the hometown I knew bled. Yet still, I close my eyes and see curving rivers and wild flower fields. Soft clouds caress stalwart mountains. Our temples stand defiant and holy. I carry that land in my blood, in my bones, and in my memories. From across the sea, I draw strength. In my present, I feel warmth. Most important, I choose to remember love. Wherever I am in this world, I remain as I was and always will be. The wheat that bursts through Sandong soil and the northern flowers that bloom in snow. Hi everyone, I'm Eve J. Chung. I am the author of Daughters of Sandong, which is based off of my grandmother's true story, fleeing from communist China to Taiwan during the Chinese Civil War. So my grandmother was abandoned in China by her father, along with her sisters and her mother, because she was a girl. And at that time, daughters were considered useless mouths to feed. So in that period, her father left to Taiwan by himself, and she and her mother and sisters had to travel about a thousand miles to get to Qingdao and then Hong Kong and eventually to Taiwan. And for context, my great-grandmother had bound feet as a child. And her feet were unbound when she was maybe three years old or four years old because it was forbidden by the nationalist government. But by then, a lot of the damage is already done because the foot has been broken. So bearing in mind that she has essentially feet that are disfigured, she pushed a wheelbarrow through rural country roads with her three daughters, and they would take turns sitting on the wheelbarrow because they couldn't walk that far. I think it's also important to note that it wasn't just about travel. My grandfather, the one who abandoned them, was from a wealthy land-owning family. So when the communists invaded, they wanted somebody to punish. And since the men were gone, they decided to punish the oldest child, which was my grandmother, who was 12 at the time. So despite growing up and being told that daughters don't count, daughters can't be heirs, when it came time to put the family on trial, she was the one who had to kneel on the ice while everybody told her what a horrible person her or what a horrible person her father was, but how horrible the family was. I think I feel a lot of sad of sadness when I look back on my great grandmother's life because she was such a strong and ingenious person, but she was also someone who suffered domestic abuse throughout her entire life. I often regret that she never had this moment where she stood up to herself in the family. And in writing this book, a challenge for me was to find uplifting moments in it, simply because I do feel so much regret for this person who I think lived for her daughters and then never really had a life that was her own. I myself never went to Sandong as a child, but I heard so much about this place. And it was such a big part of her identity. In Chinese tradition, you follow your father's family. And my father's side is from Suzhou. So technically speaking, I am a daughter of Suzhou and not Sandong. But I was so close to my grandmother that I think I identified more with her region. So towards the end of her life, she did get to go back um, after there were flights in between China and Taiwan, but it really wasn't the same. And she never really got to go back to Sandong as she remembered it. Between my parents, they talk a lot about the North versus the South. And my father often said that Sandong is famous for soldiers and bandits. And though he says that lightly, um, in truth, Sandong has a very tumultuous past. Um, in the 1900s, parts of it were um, taken over by Germany. Then it was invaded by Japan. Then there was a lot of warlord brutality, and then there was the Chinese Civil War. So when my grandmother was growing up, there was a lot of violence in the region. But when she talks about the place, she always talks about what she loved about it. I wanted to convey the affinity she had from her hometown, um, one that 
like many refugees, she can never really go back to. This is a picture of my grandmother at her graduation from Teachers College, which she is really proud of. She worked incredibly hard to get there um, because when they left China, they had nothing. And though they had family that were established in Taiwan, as a girl, it was hard to get funding for her education. So for many families at that time, and even, to, even today, um, if there are limited funds, they go towards the boy child and not the girl child. Going back to her roots from Sandong, this is a picture of both my grandparents. They both had to flee China as children. And in Taiwan, I always think it's a little funny that my grandmother happened to track down or happened to find a man from Sandong in Taiwan. And not just from Sandong, he's from the same hometown of Zuchen. This picture in the middle is a picture of my mother in Taiwan. And it's one example of not having enough information for my grandmother. So I really wish that I had sat down with her before she passed away to ask her about these experiences because I have these photos, but I have no idea where this picture was taken. I just know it's in Taiwan and my mom is too young to remember. So, you know, I wish we could say more about this building um, because it doesn't look like a particularly scenic place. So I feel like it must have had some significance to them. This is a jacket that is from my grandmother. So it's from the 60s. So I thought it would be fitting to wear it to show everyone today. But also the book talks about a jade bangle. And jade bangles, so I wore mine. A lot of Chinese women will have a jade bangle. Sometimes this could be something that is passed down in the family. And it's meant to be for protection. And a lot of people believe that the jade absorbs the wearer's essence and it changes with you and kind of bonds to you. For example, my mother used to tell me stories of people who got into car accidents and their bangle broke, but they were fine. So I don't know if it's true, but these bangles are something that mean a lot to people. Just for some background about me, I was an international relations major and I focused a lot on Chinese history. So a lot of the history of the Chinese Civil War I already had, but to write the story, a lot of it took place in parts that might not be interesting to an overall historian because there are aspects about daily life and how people lived. So part of the issue for me is I don't read Chinese. So I definitely struggle to read some of the original sources but that was also where my mom was a great help to me. So I would find things like laws about entry and exit requirements in, to Taiwan from 19, the 1940s or early 1950s. And then I would hold them up for my mom on FaceTime and she would translate for me and I would write them down. My biggest resource is probably the public library system because I go through a lot of books and I often just need one chapter or even a few paragraphs from a specific book. So I can go to the library and take out 10 books on that subject and use them for whatever purpose they fit into my book. So finding a title for this book was really difficult, um, but Daughters of Sandong came overnight. It came to me suddenly and when I thought about it, I felt like it was the perfect title because my grandmother identified so much with her hometown and the province that she came from. So even though she spent the rest of her life in Taiwan and as a child, I only went to Taiwan, her favorite restaurant was called, it was literally called Sandong Restaurant. And after she passed away, she had Sandong carved onto her grave. Um, this is a fairly common Chinese practice, but it made me realize how much she missed her hometown. So that's where Daughters of Sandong came from. And I emphasize daughters because so much of what they went through was because they were daughters and not sons. Um, they were the unwanted daughters of their family left behind in Sandong. So when we were looking at cover options for this book, it happened by accident. The team at Berkeley sent me this painting and they loved the painting and didn't realize until after they selected it that the artist is from Sandong province. So that was an amazing coincidence. and. When I was looking at his work, 
um, I fell in love with his work. And this particular painting used for the cover is called Bird of Luck. So we didn't know much about it because there isn't a lot of information about this artist in the US or in English. But after we worked with someone in Penguin Random House, Beijing, she put us in contact and the artist and I were able to hop on the phone together. And he asked me why I was interested in his paintings. And I told him that I didn't think that I saw anything that captured the woman of Sandong in the way that I think of my own grandmother and how she describes her family and how she grew up the way that his paintings do. And it turns out that he focuses on painting people of Sandong. So he is from a place called Yimin Mountains, and he travels back there and paints people from the village that he grew up in. And the girl on my cover is actually his own daughter. So there is literally a daughter of Sandong on the cover of Daughters of Sandong. So I thought that was lovely. And again, none of that was actually planned. It all happened by coincidence. And when I went to track him down, it was actually tough to get into contact with him, in part because of the language barrier and us not having any idea you know, what his contact information was. The woman at Penguin who helped so much with the process turns out to also be from Sandong. So it was a bit of this um, coincidence of all these people who had their roots in Sandong working to make this cover work out in the way that um, I absolutely love. So I'm really grateful for that process. In writing this book, a challenge for me was to find uplifting moments in it, simply because I do feel so much regret for this person who I think lived for her daughters and then never really had a life that was her own. I know my grandmother spent a lot of her life trying to make her own mom happy. So my grandmother gave almost her entire salary to her mom, who in turn gave it to her own mom in China. So I think there's this pattern of, of mothers who sacrifice for their daughters and then daughters who try to sacrifice for their mothers too. and. Ultimately, a lot of that depends on breaking the cycle that we're in. So you don't have the system where, you know, you have a woman like my great grandmother who suffers from abuse, but then is sort of trapped in part because of the economic situation and in part because of the tradition. When I look back at the woman in my family and what they endured, Initially, I felt a lot of sadness because they really suffered a lot through the war, but also through how the family treated them. And I think what I'd like people to take away is what I myself have come to take away from their story, is that a story doesn't have to end with a single person, and often a story spans generations. So I see the woman in my family as taking different steps along a road to make life better for those who followed them. I've been able to pursue my dreams in a way that was absolutely impossible for my grandmother. And that is because of the work that they've put into to make sure that their children have a better life than they did. I hope that people find this a hopeful story because that's ultimately what I want it to be. I think that access to education is important in so many ways. And in terms of gender equality, it's one of the most important tools we have in making sure that young girls have the same opportunities as young boys do.